If that is the end of the response, do you see that as a proportionate one? Well, I think it is a significant escalation over where we were um, 24 hours ago. Uh, I think many people are hoping for a response that was somewhere in southern Lebanon, maybe in the outskirts of Beirut. Uh, and this attack really struck um, inside of Beirut in a heavily populated area um, at a symbolically important target for Hezbollah. It's sure a council, the center of its decision making, as well as a very important commander, um, uh, which would be a significant loss uh, for the organization. Um, both in terms of leadership and um, tactically and operationally. Um, so it is a significant um, escalation. Um, I think what remains to be seen is how Hezbollah responds, um, whether their response is to similarly target an Israeli city like Haifa or um, another city in northern Israel, or whether it is um, more muted um, and, and, and tries to signal sort of an end to this spiral. Well, so it does feel like the next move is Hezbollah's for the most part, right, Jennifer? And if we were to see some kind of retaliatory strike against Israel specifically, would you expect we would see a similar reaction to what we saw back in April when Iran sent the drones and missile missiles in the U.S. and other allies stepped in to interfere? I think it depends how significant Hezbollah's response is. Um, uh, Secretary Austin, um, Secretary of Defense, made it clear this morning that the United States would support um, Israel in defending itself, and that means probably uh, weapon support, as as the United States has provided over the past 10 months, but also um, support, as you mentioned, in terms of air defense and shooting down drones or missiles. Um, if it is assessed that those drones and missiles exceed Israel's capacity to respond itself. Um, so I think that's certainly on the table. It just depends how significant Hezbollah's response is and whether Israel needs that assistance, um, given uh, the nature of, the, of Hezbollah's retaliation. Jennifer, as our attention is pulled to the north here, uh, we still have questions about what's happening in the south. We know the fact that Bill Burns is back in Rome, that the United States is still seeking to help in some way to achieve uh, a ceasefire with Israel and Hamas. But there has been no news on that since Benjamin Netanyahu left Washington last week. Do you think that we'll see one between now and the election in November? Um, I, I have to say I'm not optimistic. Um, there have been many points at which there seem to be breakthroughs that end up falling through. Um, I, I Netanyahu really has no incentive here to uh, conclude a ceasefire in the near term, um, given the political uncertainty in the United States um, and um, the fact that there, that his political survival really depends on the continuation of the war. Uh, the only thing that could potentially lead to um, a lessening of act Israeli activities in Gaza is really a decision to shift activities to the north. So if we were to see uh, a drawdown of activities in Gaza, a shift of forces to other parts of the country, um, refitting of reserve units, um, mobilization of new troops, um, that would tend to indicate uh, potentially a shift in focus to a ground incursion to Lebanon, which would be uh, equally bad. I do think that a diplomatic solution is in the best interests of all parties um, and probably the only way to stop the escalation and continuing violence between Hezbollah and Israel is to conclude some sort of diplomatic agreement in the South. So really, that is the crux of the issue, which is why so much attention is being focused on it. Yeah, and of course, it was just months ago that we were looking at the Houthi activity in the Red Sea, also talking about how the prospect of a ceasefire may have that proxy backing off some of its activity. So it does seem that a lot hinges on this. But Jennifer, to the point you were just making about political uncertainty in the U.S., we just listened at the top of this segment to the words of Vice President Kamala Harris trying to be stern on this issue and express the support uh, the United States has for Israel. Would you expect her policy to be consistent with what we have seen during this administration as she served as Joe Biden's vice president? I would expect there to be considerable continuity. Um, she has made it clear that she is uh, potentially more sympathetic towards the suffering of Palestinians than has been expressed by uh, President Biden. Um, and that is partly due, I think, to the nature of her political experience, which has a much shorter duration than Biden's. Biden has a long-standing relationship with Netanyahu uh, that that shapes how he thinks about um, this conflict and the support the U.S. provides. Um, uh, Vice President Harris doesn't have that. It allows her to um, be a little bit more flexible. But it's important to recognize that her position here 
in terms of being um, a little bit leaning slightly more towards pushing for a ceasefire is very much in the Democratic mainstream um, and not really leaning very far left at all. So very sort of consistent with where the party is generally. You know, it's interesting because we were talking about the fact that Kamala Harris is but largely saying the same things that Joe Biden has been saying. He rolled out the whole ceasefire from the White House. I believe it was the 31st of May, if you can correct me uh, if it was later than that. But he has been saying almost word for word the same things, but interpreted differently when Kamala Harris says them, Jennifer. How come? Well, I think a little bit of this is people trying to read the tea leaves. Um, everyone wants to think about what um, her foreign policy might look like were she to win the election in the fall, and we don't have that much data to go on. So people are reading into every comment that she's made um, in a way that um, maybe isn't intended. All the data we have really is her statements from 2019 when she was um, running for president at that time, and that was five years ago. The world looks very different now. Um, and, you know, it's important to recognize that we're not going to have that many data points um, even before she's elected yeah. because she is still the vice president. Uh, and she can't really um, deviate that far from the administration's line. Well, the vice president is notably not the president, not the commander in chief, and not, at least in this instance, as steeped as Joe Biden has been in foreign policy in his half a century uh, of public service in Washington. Jennifer, does she actually have the qualifications for the role from a foreign policy standpoint, just looking at it analytically? She has had a lot of time in government, and she has been right by Joe Biden's side throughout this um, entire, through his entire presidency, which has been a very challenging one in terms of foreign policy. And I think it's important to recognize that any president coming in um, the first few months is, um, you know, trial by fire. Um, no president coming in gets to set their foreign policy agenda and follow it to the letter. Um, every president is confronted with challenges, and really the learning happens once they're in office. Um, so I think the biggest um, factor in in uh, a potential future uh, uh, Harris administration would be who she surrounds herself with, um, who she hires into those um, top-level national security positions, um, and that will help um, to determine the direction that her administration would take. And Phil Gordon, who is right now her top um, advisor, has a long career um, in Democratic administrations and in um, foreign policy. So I don't have any concerns um, were she to be elected that she would not be able to handle the challenges she would face.